Welcome and good morning to all of you out there. We should be, at least we have uh, more than 500 people joining us today. We don't know if everybody's joining us. Um, today's webinar is around the Corporate Sustainability um, Due Diligence Directive. And uh, we will make you an introduction to what is the key focuses and we have some deep dives uh, too. The directive comes into force in 2027 and it, uh, this webinar forms part of a series of webinars on sustainability uh, that PwC uh, Denmark uh, has introducing and introducing during the next month. Um, so we also have had some webinars in the in the spring, and if you haven't seen them, we of course um, urge you to do so. Much learning in in those two. So this uh, new legislation that comes into force will be the most important and most comprehensive regarding supply chain due diligence matters. And therefore, is also one of the most important uh, legislation within the ESG area uh, and has the broadest footprint. The text and the length of directive is, is really long, is very com comprehensive and also quite, quite uh, complex. It's a directive, so it must be implemented in national legislation. Um, and you, you, when coming to, to the part about the scoping, you can say every company more or less forms part of a supply chain. So even if not in scope, it is some, it's a legislation that you need to, to have a focus on. So it's not, it's, as I said, it's a complex, comprehensive, and it's also um, having some mandatory obligations on the, on the uh, companies in scope and down the, and up the supply chain. And even though it's, it's quite comprehensive and long in, 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 in regarding to text, there's still lots of, of vague terms and a lot of questions to be raised on it. So what we have here is a focus on some pragmatics points and we are, we are deep diving into some of the legislation. I am Katrina sondergaard Byrne. Uh, I'm partner with PwC Legal um, and uh, I am a, a part of the, the legal team uh, in Denmark advising clients on, on legal issues and, and responsible for the sustainability ASG legislation as such. I've joined my by my companies, uh, sorry, my colleagues here. They will introduce themselves in a bit. Because one of the things that I would like to, to stress out that this is not a one man's job. It's very important as a company that you include all the relevant web departments that is coming into play in this, that be procurement, legal, compliance, sustainability teams, and also HR. So this holistic approach when you are working um, with the CSR Triple D um, is very important. I'm also, as a previous lawyer, uh, I've been working as a lawyer for many years, um, have a disclaimer already. We will not be touching upon everything in the directive in this uh, 60 minutes uh, webinar. We have deep dives into some, uh, some matters that we have pointed uh, out. It's simply not uh, possible with that um, short, uh, short amount of time. But as I said, I'm joined by Anas. Will you briefly introduce yeah. yourself? My name is uh, Anas. Uh, I'm a manager here at PwC Legal, and I've been working with uh, sustainability for quite some time. Uh, been looking forward to this webinar and the CS Triple D in its own right. So uh, uh, it's going to be very good today. I'm happy to be here. We're going to have fun. Rebecca? Yeah. yeah. My name is Rebecca and I am a manager in PwC Sustainability Advisory Team. I, uh, as Katrine, have a background in law um, and I advise our clients on regulatory sustainability matters, including the CSRD, the CSDDD, human rights and the taxonomy. Um, and I can't wait to uh, dive into this uh, exciting new regulation. So, so this, this part, part about, about that even though we are from different, different departments in PwC, we already always team up, which uh, which match this holistic approach, which is relevant in the ESG regulation, that being CSRD, taxonomy, um, and now CSDDD. So the agenda for today, we are going to have a brief introduction to the directive. Um, we are going to have a focus on some of the key definitions and then we have two deep, deep dives into um, the steps that is going to, we're, we're not going through all the steps, so we're taking the, the, the part on, on step three and step six, because this is some of the, the important things that uh, is, is relevant to, to be aware of. 
And then we have on sanction and liabilities and a sum up on the key <coughs> takeaways when you prepare for the CS Triple uh, D. So a brief introduction to the, the directive and the le legislation. So we, we are on a journey, you can say, on the due diligence uh, side of, of the sustainability um, agenda. So we are going from guiding principles, guidelines, and you can say what we call soft law into an area of hard law, uh, because it, uh, the CSA Triple uh, D introduces mandatory obligations, and it also sets out obligation to adopt um, and put into effect a, a transition plan for climate change mitigation. And there's my next disclaimer. We will not touch upon the climate change um, plan that is required. This will be, as a teaser, saying that uh, this will come in, in one of the following webinars uh, that we have coming up uh, on this sustainability series uh, of webinars. So before we go into details, I would like to just give a brief overview um, that this is the um, sustainability and due diligence related obligation for companies in, in, uh, around the, the globe. Um, we actually have already, um, for some jurisdiction, supply chain uh, due diligence uh, obligations uh, in force. Um, as you will also perhaps notice uh, on this slide, outside of EU, the focus of the legislation is on one or two topics, where you could say the European legislation as a such has this holistic uh, approach. Um, and the CS uh, Triple D, you say, align itself along the line of the uh, other uh, sustainability directive. Um, and we have also the forced labor regulation, which uh, currently is uh, uh, at a proposal stage, but that's coming also down uh, at the end, uh, down the line. Um, so, but what, what is this, why is this important? Because you might already be subject to uh, due diligence, uh, sustainability due diligence obligations due to some national legislation. <laughs> Um, and when aligning with, with the upcoming CS Triple D, you can say the specific regulation will always apply. So the CS Triple D is, you can see, seen as a fallback position to encapture every uh, uh, part of the sustainability due diligence processes that should not be already regulated in uh, some of the, um, the EU legislation. So, for instance, if and we have taken that also included in this in in this. Um, short presentation introduction. So if you're already or your company or some of your, your group associated uh, companies are subject to such specific legislation on supply chain uh, due diligence, um, you might already have a head start. That's kind of the good, one of the good news today. For instance, on the German uh, Act on Supply Chain Due Diligence um, will give you a, a, a head start. Yes. Um, so, just to set up a bit of a short scene, because what we really would like to go to go into the deep dives. What's important to perhaps notice? This is a slide with some some a lot of, of um, um, information on it. But the main point being that the focus uh, in the CSR Triple D is on human rights and it is on environmental matters. We have set this up on the German supply chain edge simply to identify how you must also reflect during your mapping of your regula regulation, identify regulation uh, similar to the obligations in the CS Triple D, and then align them and find out what's actually required more. So we have the human rights acts aspect, which um, you say inclu includes more or less all the human rights uh, conventions that are already uh, in place around the globe. One being perhaps not uh, thought that much about is the rights of the child. So the right of, of food and development for children. Um, that's something that might not have been encompassed already in your human rights um, supply chain due diligence process. But if you have a human, uh, human rights supply chain due diligence process or management system already in place, this may already come encompass all the obligations on the human rights aspect, which is introduced by the CS Triple D. On the environmental matter, um, on the other hand, it's a, a quite comprehensive obligations that is being introduced in the CS Triple D. So if you have um, already an environmental management system in place, 
um, you must vis uh, revisit that and then make sure that it's also including due diligence obligations, which reflected in, in these obligations in the CSDD. So that's, uh, and of course, if you don't have that in place, this is one of the, the, the main areas that you must uh, focus on. Again, comparing legislation, German Act, uh, Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, as you may see, this is a matter of perhaps of words, but the main focus and the main key um, obligations are similar. Um, except that the CSEE also introduces a meaningful engagement with stakeholders, and this is a very important part. Also, when we're coming to the scoping and the timeline of the directive, because this part about actually including your stakeholders in your processes and in your that's both upstream and downstream. We'll come back to that. It's very very important um, uh, obligation and uh, requirement in the CSEEE. Uh, and again, I mentioned point eight here: transition plan for climate change is uh, at a later on later webinar. So the timeline, um, when we kind of go to the, um, it's on the right on my uh, screen at least, uh, when, when we are, when this is fully implemented, you will find that EU companies, um, so first of all, it distinguishes between EU companies, EU com companies based uh, in, in, uh, in EU, and also non-EU companies. So for EU companies with more than 1,000 employees and a, a, a net turnover of 450 million or more on a worldwide aspect is subject at in scope for the CSDD. Um, the uh, thresholds is a bit different for non-EU companies. You can say the turnover is, is the same, but as we don't have a specific or very firm um, obligation to um, count the employees, during for, for non-EU companies, uh, this uh, threshold is not applicable for those. This is simply just a net turnover threshold. For franchise companies or license agreements, uh, you also have a, a, a smaller net turnover again um, when you when you look at that. Um, so, but again, as I said, you might most of you most li most likely will be part of a supply chain already. So even though you're not in scope. Um, directly, you will be introduced to the obligations in the CSDD anyhow. So if we go back to, uh, on the timeline, um, uh, the, and this also kind of reflects the point about stakeholders' engagement, that it is the big companies who, first of all, has to focus on this and include starting this journey and hopefully also, um, you can say, participate in training and preparing the, the companies who come down the down the line, down the timeline. Um, if a company already reports in accordance with the CSRD, the CSRD report should be sufficient. Um, that's perhaps a good point to say, but you need to, of course, uh, visit if the mandatory obligation, and specifically uh, the human rights due diligence and the uh, environmental matters uh, also include due diligence and also include all the obligations. <clears throat> so, for this one, um, simply to state that when you when you look at the CSRD and the CS3D, um, you have some some steps that you should go down, but it also taps into your governance, your compliance, and your upskilling. This cannot work without upskilling the board members and the employees who's going to work with this. Even though it's not actually a, a, a legal requirement in the directive. This is important that you you um, you empower the employees to to uh, to master this uh, directive. Monitoring and tracking of of legislation is important uh, due to the compliance uh, uh, reasons. And for governance, you must revisit your policies and update them to reflect um, the obligations in the CS Triple D. The orange part in the, the bottom, you can say, is, is some about liability, the sanctions, and we come back to that. But um, we do, do see that this is, of course, besides the repetition, repetition I can't say that today, uh, repetitional, repetitional, <laughs> thank you, risk. Um, there's also a, a risk of fines and, and of liabilities. We will come, come back to that. So... Now we go into into kind of a, a work mode. This uh, six step is is how uh, we operate when we uh, implement the uh, obligations on due diligence. Um, it's a difficult balance, you could say, precision and also being able to be flexible. 
um, you can also see again this link to our former uh, webinar on the reporting with the due diligence processes uh, to deep dive into all of these steps. But in this webinar, we will focus on step three and step six, which is the focus um, of today. Yeah. So before we dive into these two key due diligence steps, we wanted to first align on a few key definitions. And I will just stop you there because we already got a, and I should have mentioned that already. We, we, we will, will share, share the slides afterwards. afterwards. Yeah. No, no worries. worries. <laughs> Sorry. No need to take screenshots. No. <laughs> um, and the first definition we'll go into is the chain of activities. And the next one is the appropriate measures. So what is meant by chain of activities and why is it important? The term is very important because it tells us something about the due diligence requirement and the scope and also it tells us something about the political compromise. Where the CSRD and the ESRSs talk about the upstream and downstream value chain and the conflict mineral regulation and other regulation talks about the supply chain. Um, the CS Triple D talks about the chain of activities. And it's important not to mix these different terms as the scope varies greatly. And when we talk about the chain of activities as it's been defined in CS Triple D, it expands the scope of a company's due diligence from its own operations and the operations of subsidiaries to the activities of upstream business partners as they relate to the production of goods or the provision of services. And then specific but very limited activities of downstream business partners are covered. And this approach departs from the UNGPs that many of you probably know about and have worked with, and it also departs from the CSRD. And what that means in practice is that downstream activities such as the sale, the marketing, the use of products, and the disposal of products is not covered in CSDDD. And then another important uh, thing to mention uh, when we talk about the chain of activities is the fact that financial institutions are not required to consider their impacts of their downstream activities, such as their investments or their loans. They're only required to conduct due diligence in their own operations and in their supply chain, their upstream activities. But both the term chain of activities and the fact that financial institutions are uh, in scope but in a limited way are both part of the review clause of the directive, so it might change in the future. And if we move on to the next very important term, uh, that is the appropriate measures, then that definition and the later on <laughs> interpretation uh, of the appropriate measures that companies are required to take when identifying and addressing adverse impacts uh, is key. And what we can say already is that the definition of what uh, is an appropriate measure uh, is those that are capable of achieving uh, the objectives of due diligence by effectively addressing adverse impacts in a manner commensurate to the degree of severity and the likelihood of the adverse impact and reasonably available to the company taking into account the circumstances of the specific case including the nature and extent of the adverse impact and relevant risk factors. So that was a lot of words uh, and said in a different way, in a non-legal way. It means that there is a great deal of flexibility, but also not much legal certainty. And that's also why the uh, interpretation of what this means in practice is key for companies to work with these elements and to try to understand it. And if we look a little closer, a little guiding, um, then the CSDDD says that in order to decide what might be an appropriate measure in a specific situation, we have to look at the level of involvement 
um, and the company's ability to influence the business partner causing or jointly causing the adverse impact. And the reason for that is that the closer the company is to the impact or the more involved the company is in the impact, the greater the due diligence expectation will also be. So when adverse impacts arise uh, or are caused by business partners only in the chain of activities, then of course a company cannot take the same uh, appropriate measures as they can in their own operations. But that doesn't mean that they don't have an obligation to do something. They should still aim to use their influence or to increase their influence. And if we, oh, and if we are more specific here um, and um, look uh, towards the examples, then um, the CSDD actually does come up with a few examples, a non-exhaustive list of measures that companies can consider when deciding what might be appropriate. And these different examples uh, are, some, are some tools that many companies already are familiar with. Most companies will have codes of conduct and contractual assurance with their business relationships, um, supporting their risk management, especially uh, in their supply chain. And some will also have independent verification in the form of supplier audits, for example. Other examples of appropriate measures uh, are uh, or could be implementing action plans to uh, limit or minimize an adverse impact. It could also be looking at making modifications to the purchasing practices if those are the root cause for adverse impacts. It could also be providing guidance to SMEs or engaging with business partners. And the reason why we have uh, highlighted this one box um, with, uh, with contractual assurance is because we wanted to uh, dive a little bit more into that and give you some practical examples. However, before we dive into that, and Anas uh, will guide you through that, it's also important to note that while contracts can be important for implementing human rights and environmental due diligence, they are not a silver bullet because of course companies cannot expect that their issues in the, in the supply chain upstream or downstream are solved simply by changing their contracts. The UNGPs state that companies should apply a smart mix of measures. So while we focus a little bit more on the contractual side, of course, we also believe in a smart mix. Could I just uh, add to that? Yeah. Yeah. This is how I also mentioned the involvement of stakeholders and stakeholders in that regard is also your, your direct or your closest uh, suppliers, uh, for instance. And I think that also from an SME perspective, it's important to, uh, to address also that there's actually an obligation, you can say, not perhaps a legal obligation, but it's a part of the, the, uh, the, the CSDD is to have the, you can say, the big ones helping and assisting the smaller ones to doing it. What is it actually that the big companies expect from a smaller supplier? Um, and helping them adjust and, and answer those uh, questions. It's, it's, it, that's why it's, a, a, you can say, a, a, an involvement which will for hopefully implement uh, the aim of, of the directive. Yeah. So, so it has less to do about risk shifting and more to do about engaging yeah. and supporting and guiding and so on. Yes. Collaborate. Yes. yes. <laughs> exactly. Take, Take it away. Can I get the, get the thing? <laughs> so. The reason why we wanted to focus on the contracts is that you could say these regulate the links of the chain of activities. Uh, companies can do all sorts of things when it comes to their own operations and their subsidiaries, but the CSDD introduces requirements that go beyond what companies are individually responsible for. And that's why uh, CSDD is quite... Uh, direct when it comes to contracting with your business partners. 
uh, this goes both in terms of potential adverse impacts that you may uh, be a part of either in your upstream or downstream activities and actual adverse impacts that actually have taken place and bringing these to an end wherever possible. It's important to note that the CSTD is an obligation of means and not of results. And there is no expectation that companies on their own right can end or prevent completely all of the adverse impacts that uh, running a business uh, uh, may produce. But there is an obligation to at least aspire to it. And that's why the company's own code of conduct and potential prevention or correction plans are so important because this is what is going to influence how the company uh, operates with business partners. As Rebecca mentioned, contracts aren't a silver bullet, but it goes to say that you have to still consider how you may avoid uh, potential human rights or environmental violations through contracting with your business partners. Um, it's an effective tool, contracts, when conducting due diligence is because, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, it it's emphasizes the co collaboration between your, yourself and your business partners, and it also influences the available appropriate measures for you to deploy depending on uh, on how the negotiations with your business partners are. Uh, it's effective in terms of setting the standards not only for you, but your downstream and upstream business partners as well. Um, and it's a matter of delegating the responsibilities between you and your business partners. It's important to note as well that these requirements aren't uh, applying to all of the contracts that you have in your company. Uh, presumably, you have more, thousands. Uh, so it would be quite a cumbersome process for you to, to, to integrate uh, these due diligence requirements in all of them. However, there is a requirement for you to have a risk-based approach approach in terms of uh, identifying and assessing the potential and uh, actual adverse impacts. And that's going to be your guiding uh, sort of star in, uh, in uh, negotiating the contracts. Um, yeah. In terms of responsible contracting and, and you could say the previous or uh, current practices that we, uh, that, that we have looked into, there are some points that should be mentioned in terms of what is good and what is not. You could say that the, the CSTD is actually introducing a lot of flexibility in terms of how companies are expected to, uh, to approach these matters. But from our experience and understanding, there are some things that's not going to be effective in practice and which in the CSTD is not going to be assessed as being uh, effective ways to, to, to mitigate adverse impacts. You could say that previously a lot of the attention when it comes to due diligence regulations has, has been to look at your upstream supply chain, and that's something that's, uh, that's uh, changing with the CSDDD. But what that has actually caused is that a lot of customers are putting uh, requirements onto their suppliers which are effectively uh, non-manageable in practice. Uh, some of the examples we've encountered is uh, a customer trying to get a, a, a plastic supplier to avoid using plastics in the deliveries, even though plastics is what they bought from the supplier. Uh, another thing is uh, requiring uh, the supplier to have all of its subcontractors uh, comply with the uh, with the client's uh, code of conduct, which is ineffective in practice as well. Furthermore, there is the uh, audit requirements that some customers may impose on their suppliers, um, which can be a quite burdensome practice in reality uh, if you want to keep tabs on, on, on everything that, that your supplier does and if you make your supplier pay for it as well. So, uh, the CSDD is focusing a lot on how these two companies are going to, uh, to mitigate the adverse impact in reality and whether or not both companies actually agree on their part of the responsibility in uh, mitigating this adverse impact. In terms of what to do in reality, and as Rebecca mentioned, there's still a lot of legal uncertainty. However, uh, 
the focus is to collaborate and to take responsibility and to agree on responsibility and negotiate with your contractual partners. It's important that you don't employ risk shifting tactics because even though that you, by one way or the other, get your, your business partner to take on all of the responsibility, that does not mean that it's an effective way for the both of you to mitigate the adverse impacts. That's not going to be assessed as being an effective way of doing business. And that's the most important thing. It has to be proportionate. It has to be effective. Uh, so we expect that, that in the negotiation rooms that a lot of time is going to be spent evaluating both companies' own identification and assessment of the potential impacts, uh, actual or not. Uh, and contracts is going to be the output of those negotiations. So uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be in place for these contracts to be uh, effective as well. Um, another thing to avoid is strict liability clauses in terms of uh, risking a breach of contract. Um, it's an ob obligation of means, and if if suppliers or, or, or downstream partners are aware that uh, they might lose a contract if, if they don't comply with the requirement uh, quite specifically, that might incentivize them to hide if uh, they may be contributing to any adverse impacts, with this, which is uh, contradictory to, uh, to what the CSDD requires and aspires to. So this actually brings kind of a new, new, not a new as such, but it's a, it's a relevant aspect of the negotiations to say that from a legal perspective, a lawyer might say that if you breach, if you don't comply, we, we terminate the contract. Exactly. But that is not, you can say, the... That's not the spirit of the, of the regulations, of the so to say. It's a matter of, of cooperation and ensuring that your suppliers and our customers have the capacity to cooperate effectively. And that's something that you need to include in, in your assessment and, and reflections in the negotiation element. You could say that it's easy to, to put in clauses regarding audits or, or monitoring, etc., etc., etc. But it is a matter of cooperation. That's also why there's requirements if, let's say, that you're a big company with a small SME uh, uh, supplier that you need to, to, to look into to adverse impacts. There is an obligation, depending on, on your amount of influence and the challenges that such re responsibilities might impose on the supplier, uh, that you actually have a, a, quite an active role in uh, upskilling the supplier's uh, employees, uh, financing some of the infrastructure they require, uh, and stuff like that. There's a lot of strategic considerations that you need to include when conducting uh, uh, business with your business partners, partners according to the CSDD. But again, it's a matter of a risk-based approach. It's not all of your contracts that you need to, to include in this, but where you know you have the greatest risk of uh, imposing adverse impacts. Yes, I, and I can't uh, emphasize that enough to say this, this is a joint effort you can say in that regard, that you, uh, as a, you say, it, with, in scope, you also have the obligation to to get your supplies um, to deliver also on the purpose of the CSS Triple D and to help them to establish what is required to fulfill the obli obligations. Um, and I think that it's going to it it, it looks great on paper. <laughs> we hope that this is also, and I do expect also that the, the responsibility and um, uh, the accountability, especially of, of companies in scope, um, will also have to drive this. But it brings a new aspect into the, you can say, the terms and conditions and negotiations that you have with your with your uh, suppliers. Exactly, exactly. And, and contract management in its own right is going to be yes. a huge uh, challenge in terms of, of making effective and enforcing effective contracts. Yeah, and also have to, them to align, you can say, so you also make sure that, that the obligations that you put on one supplier also is reflected uh, on another. So and so, so this part of actually coordinating or be, you say, mastering your contracts um, is, is, is important. Mm. We do expect that there's going to be multi-stakeholder initiatives as well as industry-wide initiatives because requirements and potential impacts, they differ across industries. There's a difference in being a clothing supplier and an oil uh, uh, supplier. 
So uh, it's going to be very specific, uh, and there might be, be industry guidance to get. But let's say that uh, you have a business partner uh, who's not able to prevent or correct uh, a potential or actual adverse impacts. What to do then? Because it is possible to disengage from contracts under the CSDD. Of course, uh, the regulator can, can't uh, require you not to. However, there are steps that you need to take before that's an option in terms of uh, 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 posing, imposing adver adverse impacts. Um, try and use your influence to see if there are ways to get the, the business partner to, uh, to, uh, to, to act. Uh, that could be by, by adopting and implementing an, an improved action plan, which, uh, which uh, is sort of a more stringent version of, uh, of uh, what you may have already. Um, something that's quite, uh, quite uh, essential is to, to compare the potential negative impacts of disengaging from the, the business partner uh, rather than continuing the uh, engagement, uh, the focus of the CSDD is avoiding adverse impacts. So if there's a larger impact from disengaging, that might be a limitation in terms of, uh, of how you, you, you choose. Uh, yeah. But it's a matter of, uh, of a specific consideration in this regard. The point is to minimize. Um, again, the CS Triple emphasizes the company's obligation to collaborate and cooperate and avoiding uh, the adverse impacts. It's uh, it's not an obligation of results; it's an obligation of means. Uh, so uh, there's no need to sort of uh, be too alarmed out there. Uh, there's a lot of things that need to fall into place. There's coming new guidance from the EU, uh, so we hopefully get a better picture of what's the expectation from the regulator's perspective. Um, but it's important to note that this, this assessment, this, this work is going to be cyclical. You're going to need to revisit your contracts. Uh, you're going to need to revisit your, uh, your, your risk management. You're going to need to revisit uh, whether your uh, risk picture is correct. So uh, it's not a tick the box exercises. Uh, at all. Uh, it's something that's that's evolving. It's something that's uh, becoming more clear, hopefully. Uh, so uh, try to have uh, a pragmatic a approach to it and, and, and don't be afraid to, uh, to, to, to look for the pragmatic solutions. Yeah. So, and the, just before I go down to this one, um, if you have questions, please do um, submit them in the, I think there's a box on your screen. Um, and we will, will, if we can, get back to you on it. Uh, and if we, um, later on, um, I, there's one comment, I think not a question that's come in, but I just want to, to, uh, to say here that it says here, it's important also to look at the preamble of the CS Triple D to ensure that the company lives up to the spirit of the directive. Um, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it, it's sometimes that you have this very comprehensive legislation where you, as a legislator, try to encompass a lot of things. And as also as Rebecca mentioned, this is a journey. This, is, this will be perhaps revisited and reversed, um, not reversed as a such, but there's going to be a more specific specifications, obligations, and uh, descriptions that is going to be included. Um, but it's, it's always, always relevant to look at why, mm. what is actually the purpose of, of, of the director of the, of the legislation. And this will also come into a discussion when it's being going to be implemented in national legislation, um, how, to, how to do that. Mm. Yes. Um, anything else on, from your side? No. Good. So on the step six, uh, we we took a, a, a deep dive uh, dive um, on on that. So we have talked, and it's been mentioned on some of the slides, the remediations obligations, um, and the remediation means you can say restoring affected persons or person communities or environment to a situation equivalent or as close as possible to the situation that they would have been in had the actual adverse impact not occurred, proportionate to the company's implication 
in the adverse impact. So this part about understanding the adverse impact, understanding what, what has happened, what, how, what was the situation before and what is the situation after and how can we um, remediate uh, this adverse uh, impact. So um, you have to, to have that also uh, implemented in your, um, your processes. And you can say this part uh, is, is saying in the in the triple D CS triple D that it should be caused only by the company. Then there's a remediation um, that the company shall provide the, the remediation is caused jointly by the company or and a subsidiary or business partner. Then the company shall provide the, the uh, remediation. It's caused only by a company's business partner in the chain of activities. We call the chain of activities definition is voluntary um, or the remediation may be provided by the company. But the company may also use the ability to, for instance, influence the business partner that is, a, um, a co that is causing the adverse impact to provide a remediation. Reputational risk is probably the key word in that example. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we could also say that the first, first two, two boxes, boxes with cost only and cost jointly is what, what we know from, from the UNGPs as cost or contributed to and then provide remediation. Whereas the last box where the impact is only caused by a company's business partner and the term with voluntary remediation uh, is highlighted in the directive actually departs from the UNGPs. But it is voluntary, so it's not a requirement. And, and then, then we also have in the same, you can say, step, a complaint met procedure and notification um, mechanism and to touch upon uh, those, you can say, different uh, streams. Um, the, the complaints procedure is, you can say, a more uh, informal um, um, set of, of uh, complaints procedures that is used to submit leg legitimate concern regarding actual or potential adverse impacts in regards to the company's um, that could be its own operations, subsidiaries, business partners, uh, etc., and complaints that can be submitted by um, natural legal persons, civil society organisations, trade unions, or other legitimate representatives. So you must somehow um, make sure that you uh, fall into these types of categories when you are to submit uh, a complaint. So you can say we see the complaints procedure as um, a. a, a a place where you can speak up on your um, concerns, uh, speci specifically uh, if it's an actual or potential adverse uh, impact. So, and the notification mechanism is a not notification is used to submit information or concerns regarding actual or potential impacts regarding the company's, again, own so operations, subsidiaries, uh, operation business partners, operations in the com company's uh, chain of activity. And this, again, notification. So there's kind of a complaint where you can complain about something that's happened. Notification procedures <clears throat> is, is a, a place where you can raise a voice to say, we have a concern. We are, uh, have, you, uh, have you looked at this uh, supplier or something like that? So that's an, a notification uh, mechanism. Um, within the notification mechanisms, you can um, raise your concerns and sorry, your notifications uh, anonymously or, or confidential. And the obligations under these types of complaints, uh, procedures and notification mechanisms is to, we can say on the uh, complainant side, is to follow up on the complaint and allow for representatives at an appropriate level to discuss potential or actually severe adverse impact with claimants. This brings kind of a element. So if you have a complaint that are coming in, what is the relevant forum? Who is going to be involved in a potential investigation? decision-making uh, procedure within your organization. You must provide reasoning why a complaint has been considered founded or unfounded or for found and for founded complaints provide information on the steps and action taken or to be taken. So you can say this is, this is a, a, a procedure which um, is more similar to some of the procedures that we already have in place, like the whistleblower uh, mechanisms. Um, so, and so you, you are operating on a whistleblower scheme, <clears throat> which you are in Denmark, if you are in, and if you are 50 or more employees, 
you can say this, you should look into that scheme and find out if the, those obligations are met. Can you adapt the whistleblower scheme to include also these uh, to, to fulfill the obligations on the, the complainant um, mechanism procedures? On the, you can say on the notification side, it's more or less that is it, is it a fair notification? Is it publicly uh, available? Is it accessible? Is it predictable? And is it transparent? That is what you need to make sure if you have a notification, these kind of uncertainties around what is going on. It's not a complaint as, as such. Um, yeah, and you can you will find that perhaps on the complaints uh, mechanisms, you will also have to include the possibility that multi-stakeholders initiatives can be uh, processed. There might be uh, via in industry association that will establish some of these uh, complaint procedures. Um, and also perhaps you will see it uh, jointly uh, by companies. So uh, it could also be a global uh, framework agreement. So how you operate um, your complaint uh, procedures and your notification mechanisms um, is, is, uh, is, is going to be adapted into the relevant organization that, that you are, how big you are, and how you, you can say in, in other uh, terms also manage your uh, complaints that's uh, coming in. And just to touch upon the agreements mechanisms and the whistleblower schemes again, what is actually the difference? It's different, but same, but different, you can say. So where the grievance mechanisms is focusing on resolving a dispute between the grievance holder and the entity, that could be on harassment at the workplace, forced labor and the value chains, and these types um, of schemes where you can raise a concern uh, on harassment and it is being captured by a procedure that is going to deal with that, um, that grievance or that complaint. Um, on the other hand, you have whistleblower schemes and speak up policies those are, you can say, um, stricter. What can actually be uh, filed under these types of, types of schemes? It's uh, the, the more um, severe uh, breach of contracts or breach of uh, obligation, ethical obligation or criminal obligations. So you have, you can say, two types of, 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 of uh, mechanisms that is aimed at cap capturing whatever concern, whatever potential uh, impact uh, that is 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 within your obligations. And it's also fair to say, right, that some uh, uh, issues, issues or complaints, complaints or uh, reports, reports could be within, within both, both systems. systems. Yes. And, and then, then you would just have two options. options. Yeah. Yes. 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 And, and just bring in what what is you as an organization going to do? Yeah. Um, how are you going to uh, include? It? How are you going to <clears throat> process it? Who is going to be involved? And, and make sure, sure that you don't have perhaps two strings uh, within the company that's dealing with the same with the same problem. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, the last bit uh, about this webinar is a little focus on the sanctions and liability. Also, one of the game changers in uh, CS Triple D, and one of the things that really mark the shift from soft law to hard law. If we look a little closer to the sanctions, <clears throat> the CSDD requires member states to designate one or more supervisory authority to supervise compliance with CSDD, to supervise that companies are actually doing what they are required to do. And these supervisory authorities will have quite a lot of power. They will be uh, able to conduct inspections of companies, issue orders, and also penalties. And these penalties can be up to 5% of the company's worldwide turnover. So that's quite a lot, but of course they have to be proportionate. Um, on the positive side, compliance will also be uh, uh, or qualify as a, an award criteria for public contracts meaning that there is also something to gain um, by complying with CSDD if you are working a lot with public institutions. If we look towards the liability regime, it establishes liability for companies that with intent or neglect fails to comply with the due diligence obligations if such failure um, 
uh, result in damage to a natural or legal person. So there are a few things that needs to be fulfilled in order to um, be subject to a civil liability. However, if the damage is caused only by a business partner in the chain of activities, the company will not be held liable. Um, and the liability or the limitation period for bringing claims under the CS Triple D is uh, five years, and victims will have the right to full compensation in accordance with national uh, law. And as we are approaching the end of this webinar, we just wanted to finish up with a few takeaways, uh, and then we can take a few questions after that. Yeah. Essentially, there are three main considerations you guys need to be aware of. Uh, and the first thing is that uh, you probably already invested a lot of uh, skills in your organization regarding the CSRD and the reporting requirements. Uh, but CS Triple D goes beyond that. Uh, you need to be sure that you have the awareness in the boardrooms. Uh, the awareness in management and the awareness in, in the different functions uh, of your organizations to understand what your obligations are uh, and what uh, how the risk materializes for you. You need this because you need to obtain a comprehensive understanding of your potential impact on environmental or human rights uh, uh, issues uh, and how your organization is going to assess and uh, mitigate that. You need to, to, to distinguish between what is only caused by you, what is caused by your business partners, and what you are causing the two of you together, um, and whether or not there's something you can do about these potential or actual impacts. In a sense, it's, uh, it, it's a matter of asking yourselves uh, what do you want to do and what can you do about it? Uh, because the third step is a matter of, 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 of acting. And remember that the CSDD is an obligation of means, not necessarily of results. So do you uh, impose the proportionate, the appropriate measures uh, when negotiating with your business partners or in your own organization in terms of your understanding of the uh, impacts you might impose onto the environment and human rights? Yes. All right, um, so we are uh, coming to an end. We have some questions that uh, has uh, come in. One of the things that also came up uh, is on the contractual side, you can say, how you do, how you do, do that. But uh, some of them say the breach of obligations, as, as Anna touched upon, um, may not be the appropriate measure, but to help to establish collecting data, collecting certificates, um, and also work within the sectors and, and whatever uh, network that you have to kind of operate this uh, muscle to be able to provide uh, the aim of the, the directive. Yeah. We, we also have a question, question regarding slide nine, if I just go back to that. <clears throat> this one. Um, where it says, is it correct that if you already report on CSRD, then the company should not report uh, according to CS Triple D? Yes, and that is uh, correct. Uh, those of you working with CSRD and ESRSs will know that the mandatory part of ESRS, ESRS 2, has um, a um, disclosure requirement called Statement on Due Diligence. And if companies are subject to that, then they will report on their due diligence uh, in the CSRD uh, reporting, and that will um, that will be sufficient to comply with the reporting requirement in CS Triple D. Which is perhaps a good point to make. Say, there's the reporting obligations. Yeah. And then there's your due diligence obligations. Behavior. Behavior. Mm -hmm. Behavioral uh, points. Uh, yeah. So one, one thing, thing is reporting, you're not, you're not finished just by saying, oh, CSRD, yes, yes, we're, we're home free. free. There's, There's lots of the behavior side uh, still going on. 
uh, which, which is not uh, uh, subject to, to reporting, but, but is subject to your um, obligations under, under the, the directive. Yeah, and talking about the CSRD, it's, it might also be relevant just to mention here that uh, step two, as you see, identify and assess adverse impacts is also well known to many companies that have conducted a double materiality assessment as that uh, will inform the impact assessment. The due diligence process is supposed to do that. Uh, it was... Uh, adopted the directive a little later than CSRD, but in the future that is the meaning that it will inform the reporting after CSRD. It might probably be worth to mention that the CSRD does not mean you have to reinvent the wheel in your organizations. You probably already have some framework in place that might need adjustment or uh, refinement in order to comply with the requirements because sustainability, as you probably know, have been a hot potato for the last few few years. So, so, so you might want to perceive the CS Triple D as being sort of the next expansion to the framework already in place for a lot of you. Um, I also just we got a very good question on the examples here where we have uh, highlighted uh, own operations and upstream downstream activities and I forgot to say that th this is just uh, us trying to uh, make a, a, a distinction between what you can do in your own operations and what you can do in your upstream downstream uh, activities so of course uh, developing an, an, a corrective action plan could both be um, um, an appropriate measure in your own operations, but of course also in your supply chain if you have uh, instances of, for example, forced labor, child labor, and so on. So this is not a... a um, it's not an, an exclusive no, distinction, no. so to say. It's a, it's, it's a pragmatic uh, approach. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think that... When, when can we expect official guidance, guidance from the EU and when will the CSDD be implemented international law? So uh, member states will have two years to implement the CSDD, so that will be in July 2026 that Denmark will have to have a CSDD transposed. Um, the Commission has uh, been out and said that there will be guidance, there will be tools, but when that will be uh, no one knows. Uh, we could be uh, very unlucky that it's not before um, the date of uh, implementing uh, the directive. So until then, we'll have to be uh, a little creative and probably also look towards what we have already from the UNGPs and the OECD and every uh, guidance uh, uh, out there that as this builds on international uh, soft law, there is already a lot of guidance uh, to help companies. But again, use the time to, to get uh, acquainted with, with your organization and your assessments. Uh, the CSRD is in place, which could be a, a great tool in order for you to assess the potential actual impacts that you already have. So you have time to prepare uh, in terms of uh, acting on the obligations which will be, uh, be derived from the national implementation. So that, that could, could be mapping of what you have already in place, mapping up your contracts, mapping up your frameworks, the new, new rights to do this processes, the staffing compass, what is required, your environmental such. So there's a lot of things you, you can get to get started uh, already and to be prepared. And of course, this, this is a journey, so there's also going to be a guide down the road. And um, I think we're going to... to Put a stop to this. Uh, please join us at the and register for the upcoming uh, webinars. Um, make a positive difference for the nature and how to create value through value chain transparency, which also will deep dive into some of the questions that is uh, we have touched upon today. So well, have a great day to all of you. Yeah, and we will provide the answers to the other questions yeah. that you guys have yeah. uh, have stated. Yes, so and you will get the slides too. Yeah. Have a nice day. <laughs>